Hello there and today we're gonna start a new series on this channel and it's gonna be called Music is your friend classic albums. The first album that I'm gonna review in this series is the amazing Rush Counterparts album. The album actually came out around 25 years ago but it's still as fresh and I mean it's better than the albums that come out today. So without further ado let's go Rush Counterparts. This album actually came out in 93, so the album sounds a little bit more rocky than, you know, some of the previous Rush releases. Basically, the album itself was a reaction to what Rush did previously. This is the best album that Rush ever put out, and people are gonna be flabbergasted now. Oh my god, no it's not! It's moving pictures! YYZ, Tom Sawyer... This is just a better album. Moving pictures is more famous but this one is a much better album. It's actually sad that people don't know of Rush. Uh, I mean, Rush has been around for like 50 years. 50! They are a three-piece from Canada, they were formed in 1968. Now they retired, but I'm still gonna talk about them in the present because they're still amazing and even though they don't play anymore because the drummer has arthritis, <laughs> Uh, they're still one of the best bands around and their legacy is just impeccable. They're really incredible. Basically they have a goofy bass player who also plays the keyboards, they have a really goofy guitar player and they have a really serious drummer. So the singer, the bass player and the keyboard player is Geddy Lee. Geddy Lee is also one of the top 20 bass players ever. He has this high-pitched voice and a specific color to his voice that, you know, as soon as you hear a Rush song, you know that it's Rush. There are some really good guitar players in the world, but Alex Lifeson is within the top 100 and I don't care what you think, he is. That guy is especially goofy. He is that goofy that when Rush was inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, his whole speech consisted of just saying blah blah, blah 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 blah, blah 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 blah. That's ridiculous. That lasted for like minutes. <laughs> and then there's the drummer. As Jack Black would put it, the master. Neil Peart is arguably one of the top three drummers of all time and uh, and if somebody told me Neil Peart is the best drummer of all time I would just say yeah he is. He's actually that good. He's also well read as far as I can tell a true gentleman. He also writes all the lyrics and he is really meticulous about his drums. I mean he arranges his parts like some sort of a scientist. That's really some like next level sh**. And there's three of them on stage and when you're in the crowd it actually sounds like there's 10 people playing. The thing is that Rush started before video came around. They have some really complicated lyrics, you know, it's all philosophy and stuff and just like deep inner monologues. In general the rock crowd actually can't understand all of that stuff, you know, they want sex, drugs and rock and roll. While Neil is like, uh, let's talk about, you know, the role of a male or a female within a relationship and then, you know, let's talk up until dawn. And some really heavy conversations. Uh, who does that? Anyway, Rush actually plays progressive rock. That's kind of the ballpark. Uh, some of their songs are really long. They have like half an hour songs with like long intricate guitar parts, guitar solos, bass solos, drum solos, like keyboard solos, everything. And that's why they're not that popular. They're not Bon Jovi. They sold like over 50 million albums but they're still like really underground. They just didn't get the media attention that they deserve. I mean, on the other hand, video is visual. It's all looks and, you know, by the time that the videos came out, they were already around for like 16 years or something. Uh, their music and their looks couldn't fight with, you know, the guys that were in their 20s and, you know, had hair and makeup. And while Poison and, you know, those kind of clowns had songs about girls, uh, Rush had songs about women. So this album came out sort of while Nirvana was still around and, you know, the keyboard sound that Rush previously had kind of died. Although, I don't think that Nirvana actually had 
anything to do with it. I believe that, you know, if Rush wanted to stay keyboard heavy, they would have stayed keyboard heavy, but it's just, if you ask me, it's not where they belong. So again, there's a lot of, you know, keyboard hate that, you know, floats around, but uh, the truth is that Rush actually never pitched keyboards. It's just that, you know, guitars came first again and that's good. On this album the keyboards actually began to have like more sense and uh, they had like more logic to them and they actually painted the picture better off the song and that's what you want from any instrument. And that kind of an approach actually uh, needed something more out of the drums as well. And I believe that the producer Collins actually managed to, you know, pull the best out of Neil and pull the best out of Getty and pull the best out of Alex and just he just helped them create this monster of an album. Although the band seemed like they were really on their last legs at the time. I think that the band actually kind of got tired at that point. Uh, they were like drained from all the touring and all of the music obligations that they had. I mean, it was a weird time for the band. It was a weird time for the music industry. It was a weird time for music in general. It was a weird time for people that, you know, played the guitar really well and, you know, played solos. On top of that, they were all like in their 40s at the time and, you know, they had families and I don't think that they got to see them very much and that can leave a mark on a man and uh, I believe that that created certain tensions within the band and you can kind of hear it on the album if you're into Rush and you know, you know a little bit about them. The lyrics actually show that and, uh, you know, this album sort of was, you know, the bearer of bad news that would happen later within the band. This sort of, like, c'est vie, serendipity, whatever you want to call it, is just crazy. The album that came out after Counterparts was Test for Echo. And on that album cover, there was an old Canadian, sort of an Inuit grave that looks like a little figure. Many people know the artwork, but also many people actually never examined the artwork. They actually never, you know, zoomed in. The album artwork for that album was actually created by Hugh Simey, as he did, you know, in all of the Rush albums that came out previously. If you actually zoomed in to the cover, you could actually see that there are three little, like, alpinists uh, climbing that Inuit grave. The alpinists are actually connected to each other with ropes and it doesn't take a genius to, you know, figure out that people in Russia are more connected than, say, a six-piece band. Since Rush is a three-piece, it's actually quite easy to, you know, just figure out that, you know, these three alpinists are the members of Rush, although they are not in the picture, but it's symbolic. So after, you know, the tour ended for Test for Echo, Neil Peart's only daughter died in a, like, horrible car crash. And not long after that, uh, Neil Peart's wife also died, and it's that same you know, wife and like her spirit still lingers on within this album counterparts but if you look at the album cover for test for echo and actually zoom in two of the you know rock climbers are in darkness while only one of them is lit and he is on top of the grave so only one of them actually you know got to see what it's like on the other side and i just can't explain to myself, oh no, this is just pure coincidence. I don't believe that it is. And that situation with Neil actually turned into, you know, stagnation of the band and uh, the band actually didn't exist. And then you have this amazing and long Neil's journey to reconnect, you know, to the universe or to reason. And then you have the song Driven. Uh, it's no coincidence. You have this ghostwriter that's, you know, trying to find a new path for himself. So if Serendipity actually brought, you know, the members of Rush together, then uh, they were also there for when somebody has a really tough time, the other two guys actually need to drag him out and uh, help him. And that is what they did best that you at the time. They were connected to him, you know, with a rope and they didn't let him fall and luckily it all ended with Neil having a daughter again and a wife and that's just beautiful beyond belief. 
so from a fan's perspective it actually ended up with a whole bunch of concerts some new rush albums and you know this crazy amount of shows that they did before they retired okay so back to their material uh, rush can get stuck in a the rut they're not that easy to listen to a lot of their material is kind of boring and sounds really uninspired I feel that that's a consequence of you know having brilliant players within the band so uh, they feel good when they play and that's it but it doesn't actually mean that it sounds good to a listener so you can find songs within their catalog that are just like what the f is this but then again the song like right after that what the f song is just perfection it's just an eargasm after eargasm I mean you're just wondering like was this done by men or by just, I don't know, aliens? And when you listen to those songs, you just ask yourself, like, why do other musicians actually try? I mean, uh, it's just pointless. They also have problems with some of their lyrics. Some of the lyrics are way too complicated for their own good. I mean, don't get me wrong, they're great. You could actually tell that, you know, they were written by a person that, you know, knows lyrics, knows literature and is well read. They're full of, I would say, unusual words and really specific motives within the songs. And with that approach, if you talk about some, like, you know, worldly subjects, it works really well. But when you get to the, you know, nitty gritty, when you get to the personal stuff, uh, overcomplicated lyrics can create like a layer of distance from the music to the listener, and that actually doesn't work that well. But on this album, a big part of that, you know, layer was taken out and you can really like feel it so there is a type of dishonesty within you know having the drummer writing all of your lyrics and then having the bass player sing them and then just like you know creating melodies for these lyrics and they can sometimes sound really like forced and not inspired but again there are these songs where just everything is perfect so all of those like negatives that you know tampon zone between the listener and the music uh, is really thin on this album and you know it, in some instances it actually doesn't exist while the album is like still really really personal and uh, you can relate to it much easier than you know to some other rush albums or lush or, or rush lyrics and so on and all of those things actually make this the best rush album of all times. So let's talk about production. Peter Collins is a god of production. He is one of the best producers of all time, without a doubt. Although he's actually more known as a kind of a synth pop producer, he has this amazing track record. Let me just count some of the stuff that he did, and I'm gonna look to my notes here. So he began with some rock and roll albums, then he had Tigers of Pantang, and he did some amazing stuff for them. Uh, but that wasn't an album that had hits. And then he did some pop, some reggae, and then uh, he brought Nick Kershaw to the studio. So, you know, the riddle, I've got two strong arms. If you ask me, Nick Kershaw has a really good band, like now, and actually has more balls than half of these, like, rock bands that call themselves rock bands. Normally, the bass lines is always like somewhere hidden within the mix but you know with Peter Collins you can really hear it and that's great. So after that Peter Collins actually went to work with Gary Moore and Gary Moore is the best ever. Peter Collins did Empty Rooms, he did Out in the Field, he made Over the Hills and Far Away, he did The Wild Frontier, the songs Take a Little Time, The Loner, Crying in the Shadows, Speak for Herself and many other songs. After that, Peter Collins actually produced one of the best albums of all time, and that's Queen's Rikes Operation Mindcrime. That album is just too complicated to explain. You basically just push play and you listen to it, and then you say, This guy, these guys are amazing, and like, who produced this? Peter Collins did. And then the follow up for Mindcrime actually came out, and that was the album called Empire, and that album had amazing songs, uh, Best I Can, Jet City Woman, uh, Another Rainy Night, Empire, anybody listening, and you know that little tune called Silent Lucidity. Later he produced that famous Cardigan song called My Favorite Game. 
he produced and co-produced Bon Jovi songs. Uh, my guitar lies bleeding in my arms. Someday I'll be Saturday night. Always. Hey God. And he also produced some Alice Cooper songs. The most famous is Hey Stupid, but there are also some really good songs that he also produced for Alice Cooper, like Die For You. And then came Rush and you know, it's really crucial that the bass lines come out in Rush because Getty is such a huge part of that band. His bass lines are really important to the songs. Uh, when people say that, you know, production is relevant and producers are relevant, I just spoke for like a minute and I just named like 15 or like 20 or 30 really good songs. So production is really relevant. It's definitely not irrelevant because, you know, I just linked one name to these amazing songs. Success doesn't actually come, you know, random. Uh, you actually need to work for it. So before I get to the songs and the tracks themselves, I mean, uh, I really need to talk about some other people that were there for the creation of this album. Uh, so we have a guy called John Webster. He is a keyboard player that kind of worked with everybody, but he was always in the shadows. He was not prominent. If you check out his all music profile, it's just like who's who of you know, the music industry. And uh, if you want to talk about, you know, crazy all music profiles, uh, you can get a lot crazier than Bob Ludwig. He was the mastering engineer for just about, you know, half of the greatest album in the world. So then we come to the late Michael Kamen. He did like, you know, orchestra work and uh, he scored for movies and all of that kind of stuff. But most rock or metal fans actually know him because he was the conductor on SNM for Metallica and he actually made up a bunch of these like orchestrations and orchestral parts that the orchestra played with Metallica. And then we have the artwork. The artwork was done by Hugh Syme. He is the best album artwork cover designer ever. He also did a lot of stuff, you know, for marketing and if you check out his website and, you know, his work, uh, you're probably gonna, you know, stumble on something that you know and, but you just didn't know that, you know, he was behind that. He also invented Rush's famous Starman logo. He created a lot of artwork for Rush, uh, a lot of artwork for Megadeth, Dream Theater, the cover for Get a Grip by Aerosmith, Maiden's X Factor, which is amazing. I mean, the artwork is really amazing, especially when you open the booklet and, you know, you see the cover that's inside. He did the Coverdale page artwork with that sign. These are all just like legendary album covers. The artwork on this album actually isn't complicated. It's just really funny. It's actually a schematic drawing of a bolt going into a uh, nut. But the album is called Counterparts, so it just fits perfectly. The central like theme within this album is just interpersonal relationships, but especially between men and women. And I really have to point out that Rush is not into, you know, random exchange of bodily fluids. Rush goes really deep and philosophical and what is the role of a man within this world or a woman within this world and how can they actually work together in order to create mankind. I mean, that's what Rush really is and that's amazing. So the last person that I'm gonna mention before commenting on the songs is Kevin Shirley, Kevin the Caveman Shirley. He was the engineer on this album and he actually recorded the band and he made sure that the band sounds really solid. My impression of Peter Collins was that of, you know, somebody who is into unity, somebody who is, you know, really into the songs and all of that stuff. I actually never, you know, felt that he was like really technical about stuff, uh, while Kevin Shirley is that guy. I mean, he's really technical and uh, he knows how to make a band sound good. So Kevin Shirley is also one of the most famous producers ever and he worked with bands like Oh, uh, Journey, uh, Dream Theater, uh, Led Zeppelin, uh, Iron Maiden, uh, Joe Satriani, Joe Bonamassa and then, you know, a whole bunch of other people. When you like check out his all music profile, uh, then you will kind of maybe get gain some respect for producers and for Kevin Shirley in general. The songs animate. You need to listen to this song loud, especially the beginning. The band on this song sounds huge and there's only three of them. This is one of the best songs ever of all time, without a doubt. It's about questioning like who is the man on the inside versus the man who is presented on the outside. Although you could 
like literally interpret it as you know two people that are in a relationship and that actually need to uh, compensate each other and animate each other especially if you believe that you know within a relationship two people become one if you want to check out some really good lyrics just read this song I mean read the lyrics check out all of the comparisons and the verbal pornography that just exists within this song stick it out this one is a shorter song this one was the hit from this album they made a video for this one although they really shouldn't have I mean there are much better songs in this album but this one is the shorter song so it just made sense but that's so sad the song itself is like really cryptic the theme of the song hides behind like the quirkiness of the music and behind some really expensive words if somebody said that this song isn't serious I would kind of agree this song actually served as a deterrent for you know people that just listened to the single and said yeah that's not for me but you know if you actually bought the album and just listened to it you know old then you would realize that this is one of the best albums that was ever made. Rush can do a lot better than this song and they actually proved it with the song like Animate. And I would also advise you not to watch the music video and actually don't watch music videos at all when you're discovering music. You need to listen to music and not watch it. See the band actually made the song, they didn't make the video. Cut to the chase. This is one of those songs where Neil says that you should really work on yourself and you know follow your heart, follow your mind and you know go against the grain if needed and that if you have a goal that you should really pursue it and you know not care about what people think about it. You have a middle-aged man that's you know talking about following your dreams. It's not you know a 20 year old guy said it you know I mean it's somebody who actually seen the world you know and you know somebody who was really passionate about you know his drumming and he actually worked for his success and he pursued his dream so he has all of the background to actually recommend doing that. The song has a really cool solo and you should really listen to the kind of the producers uh, playing around with you know, stereo cut cut and all that stuff. That's really cool and the piano is actually quite cool within the song. Uh, I bet you know that it was there. So yeah, moving on. Nobody's Hero. This song also has a video and I would also advise you not to see it before listening to the song. I've listened to it so many times before I actually saw the video and uh, I have my own visualizations within my head for who those people were and what the song is about and I believe that's a lot better than just watching the video and having those visuals like stuck in your head. This song is about regular people that came into our lives as heroes and not some like fake DC Marvel comics. It's about like real heroes. People that are you know made from real flesh and blood and that really make an impact you know to our lives. These people are really relevant and they're never gonna you know get a two-hour documentary or you know a blockbuster action movie film about them. So Michael Kamen did the orchestration for this song. The song itself follows two different stories. Uh, the first story is about it's about broadening your horizons and you know it talks about Neil's friend that he met I believe in London and then that friend died and Neil felt really sorry and uh, he actually thought about him a lot. The second part of the song is about the girl that actually died and uh, it's this like really complicated story she was just like brutalized by some maniacs Neil knew her family he also thought about that case a lot and he tied two songs together you know and with his conclusions and with Michael Kamen's orchestrations you have nobody's hero and it's just an epic epic song between Sun and Moon is a song that was written by their friend called Pai Dubois and it's a really good song. It's not one of my favorites from this album but it's still a really good song. Alien Shore. This is really amazing. This is one of the best songs on the album. It talks about differences between a man and a wife within a relationship and uh, when you know that you know these are Neil's lyrics then it kind of makes uh, it even more magical. It basically like you know just glorifies every moment or every instance when the two people within a relationship are kind of similar when they're like intertwined and that's just like pure love like pure romance 
which is just like grab in, in a really intelligent package. The Speed of Love. This isn't a love song. This is a song about love. Rush tends to roll this way. Double Agent. This is a really interesting song. The verses are like basically spoken word and they're really uh, dark and uh, introspective. The chorus on the other hand is a little bit more open but it still has these really irregular patterns. Leave that thing alone. This is an instrumental but it's an amazing instrumental. It was actually nominated for a Grammy and I believe it's the best Rush instrumental of all time. And that's a really, really tough statement to make. Yeah, but I said it. Ah, uh, cold. Fire. This song has this phosphorescent glow. It's just amazing. It was written as a dialogue between two people that are within a relationship and it talks about disagreements or, you know, fighting within a relationship and it's really meaningful. Men tend to have this like binary view of the world and uh, this is what I do and this is what I love. Everything is black and white while, you know, when you deal with women, this song kind of states it but you know, I've felt it all my life. Everything is kind of grayscale. You can't just like make a clean cut, okay, this is black, this is white. Uh, it's more complicated than that. And this song actually deals with all of those complications that you will find within a relationship. Everyday Glory. Uh, as far as I could tell, people actually don't enjoy this song as much as they should because this is a really good song. All of the parts are really solid. The lyrics are more than solid. I feel that this is a good album closer because it actually like entices us as mankind to be better. It basically says that, you know, we need to start, you know, being better within ourselves and with our immediate environment. And then, you know, if everybody did that, you know, the world would be a much better place. Anyway, the song sounds great and the solo is amazing. In conclusion, I mean, this album is really heavy without it being sounding too heavy. If you're like a metalhead, if you like, you know, distortion, in a lot of these songs you will hear, you know, just the acoustic guitar. But that acoustic guitar sounds so good that you think that it's an electric, you know. I mean, it's just one of those uh, albums that could, you know, you could just like take the gain dial on your amp and like dial it all the way up and dial it all the way down and it would still be heavy. That's just part of that, you know, rush magic. Especially, you know, when you think about that, you know, that guitar is layered on top of some, like, amazing bass parts, amazing drums, uh, it just sounds really good. But then immediately after, you know, some really soft part, you can, like, hear, uh, you know, a PV5150, a really high gain amp, and it's just layered one on top of each other and, uh, and the guitar parts are just like layered on top of each other and it just sounds so massive. On top of that, you know, the drums are not your usual rock and roll drums, you know. There's a lot of like ethnicity to them. Uh, there's a lot of Africa within these drums and you can actually, you know, you could hear it but you don't perceive it at first but when you look at the drum patterns themselves they don't they're not like they're not your regular 4-4 beats all of the stuff that i just spoke about make this the best rush album of all time so this album gets a 48 out of 100. top that you little imbeciles that talk about like pole dancing and twerking so as you're talking about or listening to some guy talking about the size of his rims i'm gonna listen to rush Adios guys, this is the first installment of Classic Albums. Please subscribe to my channel and remember, music is your friend, so choose your friends wisely. Uh, me and Albert here are out of here and I promise I'm gonna make more videos in the future. Boom!